Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Using Multiplex Immunofluorescence to Uncover Immune Cell Signatures in the TME Using Customizable Instuplex Assize. My name is Mira and I'll be your X Talks host for today. This webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes. This presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box. And we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right hand side of your screen. If you require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending a message using this chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen only mode. Please note this event will be recorded and made available for streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank UltiView who developed the content for this presentation. LTV provides researchers with multi-complex biomarker assays for tissue phenotyping and digital pathology. LTV's Instuplex technology enables scientists to unmask and analyze the true biological context of tissue samples. LTV enables pathologists to connect traditional uh, morphological uh, analysis with multiplexed immunofluorescent data for comprehensive single cell phenotyping. Now, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's event. First off, Scott Lawrence is an associate scientist in the Molecular and Digital Pathology Laboratory for uh, Lidos Biomedical Inc. The group primarily supports the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics of the NCI with all histopathology applications from tissue preparation through staining, imaging, and analysis. Lawrence has worked in the field for over 17 years, bringing experience from the histology wet lab with digital imaging, automation, and analysis. Next is Karan Sharma, is the, currently the Associate Director of Product Management for the AltaView portfolio and is based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Prior to joining AltaView, Sharma was the Global Product Manager for the RabMab uh, antibody portfolio at ABCAM, where he focused on the development of markers and immuno-oncology, neuroscience, and preclinical mouse research. He has a successful track record of about, of about bringing new antibody-based solutions to market in the life sciences industry and is passionate about all things multiplex. And now, without further ado, I'd like to hand the mic over to our speaker. They may begin when ready. Thank you, Mira, and hello, everyone. My name is Karan Sharma, and as Mira mentioned, I lead product management at AltaView. Today, I'm going to be joined by my colleague, Scott Lawrence from Lidos, and we're going to be discussing how we can use multiplex immunofluorescence to uncover better immune cell signatures in the tumor microenvironment, and in this case, using in situ -plex technology. So we're going to be talking about multiplex immunofluorescence a lot. So before we do that, let's just talk about what, as a, as a community, we have gained so far. So first off, we're going to be talking about the H&E, uh, hematoxylin and eosin stain. From this stain, usually what you're mainly getting is tissue morphology data across the bright field uh, scan. So you're able to tell where cells are somewhat, uh, tell what they are and what they aren't, but really uh, needs a trained eye, a trained medical eye, in order to use uh, it as a proper diagnostic tool. Now, we have evolved that a little bit into an immunohistochemistry assay, where you're adding one marker, let's say in a DAB IHC assay, you're able to now add in uh, single protein detection and also some general cell type identification, depending on what the marker it is you're using in that assay. And then finally, with multiplex immunofluorescence, you add a lot more detail to that same section. So one example of that is multiple protein detections versus just looking at one. Uh, through uh, adding multiple markers, you can now do a deeper cell type identification. Because it's fluorescent, you're also adding a range of expression for each of those biomarkers. And now because you're looking at multiple cell types and you can tag them, now you can look at their interactions as well. So let's just look a little deeper into that one image. What you're actually looking at over here is an FFPE melanoma tissue that's been stained with three markers. So these being CD3 in red, granzyme B in green, and SOX10 in cyan. CD3 is going to be tagging your general T cell population. Granzyme B is going to give you a status of cytotoxicity in your cytoplasm regions. 
And then SOX10 is a nuclear marker used to usually tag melanoma cells. So those markers by themselves, if we were to use them in a DAB assay, would only give you those answers separately. And it may not give you enough information, but when you combine them together, you're able to functionalize and get a lot more data out of your sample. And that's what we're seeing here when we look in the zoomed in section. Let's look at these two cells. So you see that this top cell is tagged by CD3, so we know it's a, indeed a T cell. You see that there's granzyme B population, so you know that it's cytotoxic, but you also notice that it's polarizing to the bottom side of this cell, and that membrane is actually flattening. And now let's look right next to its neighbor, the SOX10 cell marked by that marker. It's a melanoma cell. That membrane is also flattening right next to this flat membrane. In this screenshot of time, we can functionally say that this T cell is indeed cytotoxic, and it probably is also interacting with this SOX10 tagged uh, tumor cell. This is the power of multiplex immunofluorescence. It's not just about identifying markers, it's about phenotyping cells spatially. So there are a lot of multiplexing platforms that are available to the community, and I'm here to say that they all have their place. All of these platforms have elegant solutions for your specific research question. And so one way to figure out what might be the best platform is based off of your sample throughput and your multiplex level. So let's do that. Right here, we're looking at three segments uh, from exploratory discovery, translational, and clinical. So if we're looking at exploratory discovery, this is a more biomarker discovery phase where there's a high level of complexity because you're looking at so many biomarkers and there's a focus on expression levels and heat map comparisons. Um, over here, you're trying to find out what is standing out based off of your experiment. So naturally, you need a lot of markers, sometimes 40, sometimes 50, and the sample throughput is low because you're already getting so much out of those samples. Now, whatever you discover from that exploratory phase, now you need to validate it. So it's a phase where you're going to be doing a lot of accelerated hypothesis testing and collecting those insights and making sure that this biomarker has a level of robustness around it. So it's now changing the focus onto biomarker interactions and cell-to-cell -cell interactions and trends. The multiplexing here is naturally going to decrease because you've identified those biomarkers you want to focus on from your exploratory discovery, and naturally your throughput is going to increase, your throughput needs are going to increase as well. Now that you've found those biomarkers that you have validated in that translational portion of your studies, now you have to assess the utility of these biomarkers. What does that mean? Well, now that you've gotten these biomarkers, you want to assess if they really are good signatures um, by themselves when you apply them to patient cohorts and correlative studies and clinical research. Uh, for example, but also can you deploy it, right? So can you uh, give this to your CRO partner if you're a pharma? Can you give it to your partner lab uh, down the street, maybe even down the hallway? Um, you want to make sure that whatever results you get from the lab uh, where you've originally done this work can also transfer over to any other place in the world, essentially. And that's where uh, AltaView thinks we can fit in, is that we're in the space in between translational and clinical where we do offer a level of multiplexing, but really what we don't want to forget is that at the end of the day, we need to uh, also uh, think about sample throughput and that we need to test multiple samples and not just multiple cells. So let's just dive into the assay chemistry for a moment here. This is the backbone of the Incituplex technology. Uh, as you can see, the way we've designed this assay is for it to mimic immunohistochemistry in the sense that we're using single steps along the process. So let's start with the antigen retrieval. We only use one antigen retrieval step, BH9. And uh, after that, we then stain all the antibodies in one cocktail step. So we don't stain and strip, stain and strip. All those antibodies are cocktailed together and then incubated on the sample. Now, each of those antibodies is linked to a DNA barcode, and these DNA barcodes within themselves are unique. And then after those antibodies have stained to their epitopes, now we're going to amplify those barcodes. And this is where the Incituplex technology differentiates itself from other barcoding technologies you might be familiar with. It's this amplification. It's the ability to take these DNA barcodes and create these tandem repeats, and that's going to be really important later, as you'll see. So once we've amplified all of those barcodes um, that are associated with their respective antibodies, now we're going to introduce imaging probes. So these imaging probes have two components. Uh, one is a complementary DNA strand that's going to hybridize with those DNA barcodes attached to the antibodies, but they're also linked to fluorescent dyes. And these fluorescent dyes uh, are fall within the FITSI, TRITSI, SI3, uh, sorry, FITSI, uh, TRITSI, SI5, SI7 channels. And they're all sexually distinct, so you don't need to do any spectral mixing. So when you mix, your, uh, mix all of these fluorescent probes together, hybridize them to these now amplified barcodes, 
Now you can pop that into your slide scanner and detect without any unmixing at all. All the data just comes off right, right off the scanner. So if we look into the workflow, let's divide it into automated staining, cold applied imaging, and image analysis. We want to make sure that the Insight Duplex technology plugs into the workflow you most likely already have in your laboratory. So when we look at staining, you have two options. You can run it manually on the bench, or you can use an automated stainer, for which you have two options. Right now, it's the Leica Biosystems Bond RX and the Bond RXM auto stainers. Once you've stained all of those uh, slides, which would take about five and a half hours, now it's time for imaging, where you have a whole suite of imagers to choose from. Usually, uh, this takes about 15 minutes per slide. It depends on the size of the tissue and other factors, but usually we'd say it takes about 15 minutes per slide to acquire all of that data. And then finally, if you are going to be using an image analysis uh, uh, algorithm or any type of uh, proximity analysis, let's say, you don't have to use uh, any software that Ultraview develops. We plug and play right into what's commercially available. Examples of this being Indigo Labs or Visio Farms or even QPath. So now that we've gone over the chemistry and the workflow, let's talk a little bit about the advantages. First one, uh, pretty easy. I think we, we were just discussing this. It's more biomarkers, right? The ability to assess multiple signatures on a single sample. If you were to look at, uh, let's say, CD3, 45 row PD1, and pancytokeratin on serial sections, you're able to look at those signatures alone, but you can't necessarily say that those signatures are looking at the same cells. Now, when you combine it with ISP, you're able to look at all of those together. And you're able to look at them still by themselves by turning off the other channels, or you can look at them in conjunction. The second is whole slide imaging. And in Ultraview, we think this is extremely important that because we're adding so much bias when it comes to immunohistochemistry in the first place, from the tissue biopsy to the blocking to the sectioning, we're, intro we're introducing less and less amount of sample. Um, that it's really important that with whatever you do are able to get on that slide, you should be able to get all that data. And so because our dyes are structurally distinct, we're just using um, the scanners as they are uh, with the addition of a size seven, and we're collecting all of that data. And now you get to choose your ROIs. So you can get the whole slide and then investigate all of the phenotypic populations that are present and also zoom in and choose what, I, what actually is more relevant for your project. The third being single cell phenotyping. So with the Intituplex technology, because the detection is linked to the antibody and not the environments around the epitope uh, where you know, some technologies like TSA revolves around uh, tyrosine residues being um, available around your epitopes, there isn't really any uh, steric hindrance or inhibition to co-expression of markers on single cell. And here's an example of that. So over here, we have a panel of three markers, um, CD3, CD45RO, and PD1. And on the right, you're indicating, we're indicating phenotypes that you're seeing in this sample. This is also in a melanoma tissue, by the way. So in red, you're seeing T cells that are tagged with CD3. And then in yellow, you're seeing cells that are tagged with CD3 and CD45RO, which would indicate a memory T cell phenotype. And then cells that are here tagged in this light purple are cells that are tagged with CD3 and PD1, indicating a suppressed T cell. And then finally, you can look at all three cells on the same cell compartment. And you're seeing that in white, with, uh, which we're calling triple positive T cells. Maybe they're even an exhausted memory T cell phenotype that are tagged with CD3, 45RO, and PD1. Another really important part is that whenever you're developing in a multiplex panel, you want to make sure that that one panel that you've optimized can be applied to all tissue types. So that's what you can do with Incitroplex technology. Again, because the detection is linked to the antibody and not the environment around the epitope, um, you don't have to, let's say, optimize a panel for non-small cell lung cancer, and now you want to investigate that same, uh, same panel in colorectal cancer or breast cancer and do some more tinkering work. Once you have the optimized panel, you can just plug it across all those tissue types. That's what you're seeing over here. This is an example from a team at Boehringel Engelheim. They presented this work at the SISD conference last year where they wanted to find universal signatures across the pdl one checkpoint in both colorectal cancer and Crohn's disease to see if there was any type of unique biomarker signature that they can just plug and play to both uh, types of indications. So that's exactly what they did. You're seeing this in bright field. That's because uh, in Halo, they prefer to make a pseudo bright field image using the multiplex immunofluorescence. 
But you're seeing that the same panel was applied to cold CRC samples, hot CRC samples, lesional uh, Crohn's disease, and non-lesional Crohn's disease. And from there, they were able to plug and play, get their analysis and their insights. What they did happen to find in this was that cold CRC and non-lesional uh, CD behave similarly when it comes to pdl one expression in populations, and hot CRC and lesional CD behave similarly. Another really important aspect is that um, with ISP, downstream assays are possible. We use a really gentle approach when it comes to staining the antibody. There's only one antigen retrieval, no matter whatever the plex is. And uh, we also don't damage the tissue uh, afterwards by using any additional stripping techniques or bleaching. So what you're seeing over here is a tissue that was stained with a panel of four markers, CD8, CD68, PDL1, and pancytokeratin. We collected all of that data through the fluorescent slide scanner. And then on the bottom, you're seeing an H&E. And this is an H&E of the exact same slide. It's not a serial section. It's not a pseudo H&E using software. It's the true H&E that you're seeing over here. So now, if you're a group that, has, that is working with medical pathologists that are used to bright fields and don't want to change, and you have a team of image analysis scientists that are now really trying to adopt fluorescence at scale, both those groups can work very well together because you're getting your bright field data, you're getting your fluorescence data of the same sample. So it's going to be able to allow more collaboration within your team. So those are just some of the advantages, but now how are we offering this to the community? So the first way that we have done this is through a portfolio of prefixed kits that we call ultimapper kits. So they're designed uh, to phenotype the tumor microenvironment, and this is what they look like. So there are six kits, and really it's focused around amino oncology and T cell biology and some themes that are very, very familiar to all of us. If we just go down the list, the PD-1 kit and the PDL-1 kit focus on themes of immune cell exhaustion as well as tumor evasion in the tumor microenvironment. Second down, uh, second row, we're looking at the APC kit and the TAC kit. So what if you had the question of what cells are activating my T cells and also the question of how activated are my T cells and are they cytotoxic and are they proliferating? These kits are gonna help you get those answers. The APC kit would identify if your activity is coming from your dendritic cells with CD11C, your B cells, or your macrophages. And with the TAC kit, you can identify your T cell population if it's cytotoxic with your enzyme B or proliferated or activated with TIE67. And then finally, a natural question you might also have is, well, what are the causes of immune cell suppression? Are they coming from myeloid-derived suppressor cells? Well, you can use the MDSC panel for that. Or is it coming from regulatory T cells or even uh, that with, uh, CD8 positive regulatory T cells? Well, you can answer that question too with the T-Red kit. So that's how we first originally offered uh, the portfolio to the community. Uh, but there's a natural question here in that you like the inside your place uh, technology. There are clear advantages, but you don't see your markers uh, in this portfolio. So that's why we've introduced the UView biomarker menu. Customizable multiplex panels built on demand. So it's a modular platform that uses your existing histology suite, what we talked about earlier from staining, scanning, and image analysis. You pick your markers and develop your specific panel. You choose your level of multiplex. The menu that you choose from is always growing, and you get a dedicated assay development team. Let's go into each of those one by one. So the first being the configurable panels. A couple slides ago, I showed you the six kits that we have in our portfolio, ranging from the PDL1 kit to the MDSC kit. If you were to order these, you get these fixed panels, and they give you fixed answers. These are great panels, but if you uh, have a different question with any of these markers, you can't use any of these kits. And so that's why we developed the biomarker menu, so that you take all of the unique biomarkers that you see over here and individualize them. So let's say you like some of the markers here, but you want to mix and match. You can now do that. In this example, this is a sixplex containing CD3, 11C, CD20, 68, TI67, and pancytokeratin. All of you develops that assay fully and then delivers it to your lab, and you just plug and play. The second feature of the biomarker menu is that we're also increasing the level of multiplexing. So I'm just going to go over the chemistry very quickly of how this works. So it's essentially the same as what you saw previously with the fourplex there's still only one antigen retrieval step. Instead of adding four antibodies, we're going to be adding eight antibodies that are all conjugated to unique DNA barcodes. 
all of those eight DNA barcodes are all amplified at the same time. Now, this is where the workflow uh, has an addition. We uh, add in a mixture of probes for antibodies one through four. We image that on the slide scanner, and that's where you're getting this round one of imaging. Now, we use a process called DNA exchange, which is a gentle dehybridization process that removes the complementary probes uh, from their DNA barcodes. So now if you were to image that again, you would get no signal. And then we add in a second mixture of fluorescent probes, and these are targeting antibodies five through eight. And that's what you're seeing here in round two of imaging. And you can see this is of the same ROI. Now, there are various software options you can use to stack both of these images, and now you get a composite image where you're seeing all eight biomarkers together. So what you're seeing over here are the 20 markers that are pulled from those six Ultimapper kits. And what is very clear here is that if you want to investigate immuno oncology, you definitely need more markers. There are phenotyping markers, uh, and there are also even emerging biomarkers that people are using in the literature now that aren't being found here. So we are proactively adding more markers to this menu as well. And that's what we've done. So you can see we're adding emerging markers like TIGIT, but we're also expanding a little beyond immuno-oncology with cell death markers, as well as phenotyping markers, such as B-cell markers that you're seeing here, like CD19, CD22. So this list is always going to be growing, and you can always expect an update whenever you go on the website to see more markers in this list. And then finally, we think this is a really important part, because with UltraView, we have this technology, the Insight technology, we don't offer it as a chemistry and then uh, let you run with it. Uh, we want to give you a full assay so that you don't have to do any assay development yourself. You just plug and play into your auto stainer and go. So with this dedicated assay development team, when you engage with us for a UView project, uh, you get a dedicated project manager, histo technicians that are experienced in both bright field and fluorescence assays. You get milestone-based pathology review and a dedicated manufacturing team for kitting the end result right before we deliver it to your lab. In addition, if you're going to be uh, engaging in a UV project, but you want to use a marker that's not in that menu yet, or you have a preferred clone you absolutely need to use, or you've developed your own clone, those are options too. Uh, we can make a multiplex panel uh, based on uh, what you've already optimized in the lab, um, or if you have any specific preferences. In addition to that, uh, we can also embark on the validation studies um, if you want us to do them in conjunction with your lab, such as precision, accuracy, or reproducibility experiments. And then finally, especially if you're a pharma company um, and you are only going to be testing this with a couple of slides, confirming that it works for your project, and then sending off either to another partner lab or a CRO, we can also transfer these assays directly to your CRO partner. So. Now we're going to talk about how we did this with Scott Lawrence. So Scott was our uh, first beta tester, if you will, of uh, using the UV biomarker program, and his team wanted to develop an 8-plex. So the markers that they were looking at were the following, CD3, CD4, CD8, CD68, FOXP3, PD1 and PDL1, and pancytokeratin. So essentially looking at T-cell subsets, macrophages, regulatory status, and the PD1, PDL1 checkpoint axis. A couple of things that were really important for this team was that they wanted this panel to be plug and play, and they also wanted it to work across multiple tissue types since their group was going to be acting essentially as an internal core to a lot of partner sites. As you can see here on the right, uh, this panel, no optimization between these tissues um, can be applied. So look, you have uh, non-small cell lung cancer, DCI breast cancer tissue, and colorectal cancer tissue. All four of these samples were run on the same run on the auto scanner. On the bottom left here, you're also seeing that these eight markers can be assessed by themselves, but it's more interesting to look at them together because that's how you can really start to phenotype the same way you would in flow cytometry, where you can see CD3 by itself and you're looking at T cells, or with, in conjunction with CD4 and you're looking at T helper cells. But this is really the power of multiplexing is that when you don't have steric hindrance in your assay, you really can tag multiple markers where they exist in biology and deep dive into these really special phenotypes. You can see that when we zoom in over here, uh, you can very clearly see certain phenotypes like CD3, CD8 positive cytotoxic T cells, exhausted T cells marked by PD1 or Tregs with CD3, 4, FOXP3, 
this is going to make it really easy to plug into image analysis. And so actually at this point, we're going to be handing it over to Scott Lawrence, and he's going to show how he's used this panel so far with his research. Okay, great. Hello, and thanks, Karan, for the great overview of UltraView technology. Today, I'll talk about how my group has started to implement the TMA Apex within the lab. The TMA Apex assay allows us to get more context per slide and indeed provide new insights that are either not possible or prohibitively costly in terms of resources through conventional means. And this would be the HEs and um, multiple singleplex IHCs. I'll briefly talk about on how my lab plans to use the technology on whole tissue slides, but the main focus will be on the information we can get from tumor microarrays and if TMAs are sufficient for capturing biomarker variability observed in whole tissue sections. While the data is still being generated and we are very early in testing, I hope to share our approach and impress upon the utility of the multiplex IF assay to facil facilitate these discoveries. Uh, so this is our disclaimer. While not simple to understand what is going on in the H and E image shown here, there is uh, only a bit of data that we can actually get from it. We can certainly make out the lymphocytic population from tumor cells and stromal cells, et cetera, but what of the underlying biomarker expression? What is lacking is a true characterization of the individual cell phenotypes that make up the populations of cells within this field of view. And while the H&E image is by no means uninformative, we can add a layer of additional information by looking at the TME in a different light. But what does it take to actually study the tissue microenvironment in a histological section? <clears throat> Robust detection of relevant biomarkers to start Due to complex and vi the variable nature of histological sections, the assay needs to be able to overcome the common issues inherent in the technology itself. For multiplex fluorescence, some examples include autofluorescence, which can come from endogenous sources such as red blood cells, collagen, and elastin, controlling for fluorophore spectral bleed over when considering five or more distinct fluorescent channels. And single amplification is often necessary, but is recommended to have a linear amplification when considering quantitative measures of signal intensity. High resolution imaging combined with specific signal localization will allow for accurate and consistent cell phenotyping. And of course, as with most studies, the more sampling, the better to approximate the actual biological effect or expression in a population. As I hope to show later, we hope to utilize TMAs to quickly encompass the tissue heterogeneity and get a better understanding of the tissue microenvironment. Finally, while we're interested in looking at the spatial relationships between cell phenotypes, we take a holistic approach to analysis by analyzing cell populations at multiple levels or resolutions to better understand the tissue microenvironment. Current technology makes it possible to analyze whole slide images at multiple resolutions in one pass. Here's a list of the relevant phenotypes for the TMA Apex panel, including single cell visualization of select phenotypes to the right. Staining for this biomarker panel on a single slide allows to delve deeper into cell subtypes and single cell, with single cell resolution while conserving tissue. For instance, we can pick up all the T cells or focus strictly on cytotoxic T cells, exhausted T cells, and exhausted cytotoxic T cells. The single localization is excellent and we're able to discern signals within nucleus, cytoplasm, or the cell membrane. So my group routinely deals with samples from a number of sources, including whole tissues, needle biopsies, cell pellet preps, and TMAs. Much of the samples are archival and were not collected with doing IHC in mind, much less multiplex IF. For our samples, it is imperative that the assay is very robust and able to accommodate tissues that are over 30 years old and have embedded in beeswax. And yes, we've actually had samples embedded in beeswax uh, to freshly made high quality cell pellets. Today, I'll talk briefly about whole tissue samples, but mainly talk about our approach to TMAs. 
To address the performance of the TMA Aplex for the tissue microenvironment analysis, we stained NSCLC and DCIS samples, both important histologies for my group going forward. Here we look at isolating the exhausted T cell population, the CD3 PD1 cells, within 20 microns of the immune evading tumor cells with the phenotype CK PDL1, as this has been shown previously to have biological relevance. This is a blow up of the analysis of the NSCLC sample. And we can see that we're able to capture the population of the exhausted T cells that are within 20 microns or less, shown in red, to a neighboring immune evading tumor cell, shown in blue. In green are the remaining exhausted T cells. In addition, as previously mentioned, we look at the data on multiple levels. In this case, we're looking at clusters of exhausted T cells as we can define what a cluster is by how close single cells are to each other of like or similar phenotypes. We also look at the relationship of the clusters to other objects of interest within the tissue space. We plan to expand this analytical approach to other phenotypes listed as we start to analyze more specimens. So moving on to the TMAs. Tumor microarrays are able, or tissue microarrays are able to provide a cross-section of many specimens or histologies on a single slide, providing an ideal tool for screening samples. The advantages come from the increased efficiency using less resources in tissue sections, slides, reagents, and potentially time and effort. One of the major critiques for using TMEs is the limited sample size each core represents, only encompassing hundreds to maybe a couple thousand cells. Here is a commercially available TMA with multiple histologies that we ran with the TME Aplex assay. And with a quick glance, we can observe different expression profiles that make up the different tissues present. When looking at the measurements of the various phenotypes across all the cores, we see a few standouts. Clearly, lymphatic tissue show an increased expression of lymphocytes, lymphocytes as expected. While well, one case of the head and neck samples showed increased levels of lymphocytes when compared to the other related cores. Focus, focusing on the tumor types that we're concerned with in my group, tumor subtypes were added to see if any, any differences stood out. We can see some clear differences in the cell population makeup of the different cores. For the breast cancer samples, we see that the fibroadenoma core appears to have more lymphocytes than the invasive ductal carcinoma samples, but which does not necessarily agree with what's being depicted. However, there were three IDC cores in total, two of which present little to no lymphocytic expression, one of which is shown here. This clearly highlights some of the concerns with TMAs and why more sampling is needed to properly understand sample size and phenotype heterogeneity when it comes to TMA aplex in these TMAs. The lung cores are more straightforward in this instance, showing a decrease in lymphatic, lymph, lymphatic expression in, from adenocarcinoma through the small cell carcinoma. One way we examine how much coverage we need to properly estimate the TMA aplex assay in TMA cores is by trying to recreate the TMA cores in a whole tissue scan. In this manner, we will directly compare the restricted coverage from TMA cores to whole tissue data. We will also be comparing actual TMA cores with the same histological subtype as the whole tissue slide. This combined approach should provide a more complete picture and answer firstly, how much tissue coverage is needed to properly estimate biomarker response from different analytical targets and tissue histologies. And secondarily, how many TMA cores do we need? Since TMA cores are typically focused on a specific and relevant region of interest, we expect we'll see need less cores to represent the TMA aplex assay than random field generation. Another possibility is to have a pathologist define fixed regions of at a known tissue coverage to be more in line with the TMA cores. To see if we could estimate the amount of tissue coverage needed, we ran a first pass on the NSCLC sample we had. Here, the amount of tissue coverage was sampled at 5, 15, 50, and 85%. The regions of interest were fixed in size, 
and we generated randomly and were gen generated randomly within the primary whole tissue annotation. Two relatively abundant targets were chosen, T cells and macrophages, a phenotype that has an obvious positional bias on the whole tissue, the immune invading tumor cells, which cluster to one side on the sample as shown in green, and a rare event exhausted T cell population. Each marker was then normalized to the number of total cells at each coverage level as percent positive. T cells in the red here, the most abundant target, appeared to level off at around 85% coverage. The exhausted T cell population to the far right in green had the most variability, but started with very low percentages to begin with. Interestingly, the immune evading tumor cells here in the pink color didn't exhibit a very large change between the five and 100% coverage, uh, looking at 32% to 35% positivity respectively. More and different samples need to be run and adjusting the region size of interest to a smaller field of view to better reflect the TMA core sizes. But at least this is an interesting start of what we're attempting to do. So we're excited to start using the TMA Aplex assay in the lab. The assay is able to provide additional information on these key cell phenotypes observed in a tissue microenvironment. And while we plan to run on whole tissue mostly, we're also interested in using these TMA cores for additional insights. Questions still remain whether the TMA cores can actually capture the tissue and biomarker expression heterogeneity. Simulating a TMA on whole tissues might be a possible approach to see how we could how much coverage or cores would need be needed to actually capture the biomarker expression. Additionally, we hope to expand the analysis on TMAs, including tumor-specific arrays, to see if we can observe phenotypic signature using the Aplex assay on tumor subtypes and other criteria. With that, I'd like to thank all these folks that have made this work possible. Uh, thank you for your time, and now I will pass it back to Mira. Thank you. Thank you very much for that insightful presentation. Um, now I would like to invite our audience to continue sending their questions or comments right now using the questions window for the Q&A portion of this webinar. I've already received some questions, so let's start with those. Our first question here today is, how does this compare to Codex, uh, which also uses uh, oligo-labeled antibodies? Is the major difference the amplification? Sure. So, uh, Scott, um, I can take that one, and then if you have any feedback, I'd be happy to hear from you as well. So, <clears throat> the Codex platform, uh, is, you're right, it is similar in terms of the fact that they're conjugating unique DNA barcodes to antibodies and then staining it on tissue. Um, the uh, one, uh, one difference definitely is that signal amplification. Uh, so, this is important when you're looking at low expression markers um, uh, and rare events that may be missed without amplification. Um, I think, in person, the Codex tool is fantastic. Uh, that's exactly, if you remember the graph we were showing, it really fits beautifully in that exploratory discovery phase where level of multiplex really matters. Um, AltaView, while we have a, we're a multiplex uh, platform, I'd really say we're more an assay development company where once you've gotten all those answers from your Codex uh, experiments and you filter them down to the key biomarkers that are really going to matter, now that actually makes for a beautiful shift over to another antibody barcoding technology, um, which with amplification that you can use at scale, uh, which is fully assay developed, you just plug and play. So I'd say the difference is the signal amplification. Um, they're more focused on how many markers you can get on a slide and more focused on more on how many slides can you get done in your study. Um, but both platforms are, are really good. It really de uh, depends on uh, what you're doing right now, what part of your research you're in. Yeah, uh, Karan and I would agree. Um, just to chime in from the lab perspective, we looked at both technologies um, in fairly good detail, and I agree that the codex technology is extremely powerful, but the one outstanding issue for us was the throughput. Um, because they're running so many markers and, and, and stacking so much uh, data onto one slide, which is wonderful in an exploratory perspective, uh, for my group, at least, it was enough throughput to manage, you know, hundreds, of thousands of slides that we would process through this assay. Um, so that's one of the principal reasons why we are currently going with the old view technology, although we are exploring options in the um, more explorative phase, as Karun has mentioned. 
Thank you for those answers. Our next question here is how many slides can I stain in a workday? Sure. So when it comes to staining specifically, um, it's five and a half hours. So uh, it depends on how many bond RXs you have uh, for one. Uh, so let's say if you have one, that's 30 slides in five and a half hours. If you were to do an overnight run and then another run, when you come back during the day, you could technically get two runs done. Um, but, uh, you know, if you also have three bond RXs, that's triple the amount of throughput. Um, so that it's really dependent on the number of uh, automated auto standards you have for the same portion. Thank you. Our next question is, can I make a multiplex panel with markers that I have validated in IHC? Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's a really good question. We, uh, all we're really doing is antibody conjugation and then doing that screen of the off the shelf antibody um, and then testing it in the inside duplex platform. So uh, a couple of considerations, and this is similar across all these platforms that are conjugating antibodies. There is a strong preference for the antibody to be uh, monoclonal um, so that there's more consistency from lot to lot of that antibody used in the panel and also um, that it's free of carrier proteins that may um, interact with the antibody conjugation phase. But if there's a preferred clone, uh, we can always investigate that as part of the project. Thank you. Our next question is, how long does it take to develop a custom multiplex panel? Yeah, that's a really good question. So. Um, developing a panel um, with, with AltaView, a UView panel, it's dependent on a couple of factors. One is uh, the level of plex, as well as if you're using markers that are on our biomarker menu and pre-verified, or if it includes uh, a custom marker. Um, if you do have questions about that, we can always talk about it offline. You can reach out to me. What I would say is that it's, this is on the scale of weeks um, to get it to your lab and, and stain. It's not... Um, uh, an assay where we give it to you and then it's months for you to do all of the assay validation and optimiza optimization. Uh, the, let's say, for example, a menu marker uh, panel fourplex may take about uh, four weeks and then we deliver to your lab and you plug and play and go. And uh, Scott, I know we're working on uh, delivering our panel to you, but you could probably speak to um, what was the timeline of when we'd be ready to ship it over to you. Yeah, it was. I mean, they're quite responsive and quite quick. I was actually surprised because we've done prior to working with Ultiview trying to do this stuff in house. And um, I think the last panel we did was eight to 12 months to get it fully vetted into production. Uh, the Ultiview team is very responsive. And again, I would say within three or four weeks, we actually had a full function panel. And um, if it wasn't for our current COVID situation, we'd actually be doing it in the lab right now. But of course, uh, that changed the timeline for us. Thank you. Our next question here is a two part question. So the first part, first part asks for the two round imaging, the registration between images acquired at different rounds need to be done. I'm wondering how easy is it or how reliable is it? And the second part is, um, is there any way to increase the multiplexing capability by combining UltiView with spectral unmixing? Sure, yeah, so I can uh, probably take that one on. Uh, in terms of the co-registration, uh, as I was mentioning in the presentation, there are a couple of options that you can do today. Uh, we have a couple of customers today that are using high-plex, uh, if you will, meaning five markers or more, UView kits um, with, and along with Halo 3.1. And they've been using that image alignment to have uh, very good success by just using what's uh, used in Halo. Um, AltaView is also going to be releasing uh, a piece of co-registration software just in a couple of weeks uh, that we call Ultistacker software. And so uh, that's going to also help uh, with the image alignment. That's what we actually use internally for any of our services projects. Um, we personally think it's, it's very robust, but we, are, we can uh, do a virtual demo to show how that works with a round one image and a round two image uh, so that you can assess for yourself how good the alignment is. Um, and then the second question was asking, can you in increase the level of plex by uh, introducing a level of spectral unmixing? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's, it's not something that we do um, or is in our pipeline to do. But if uh, I'm assuming it, you're thinking of either something on the Polaris, which right now the limit is, uh, I believe, eight plex nine color, or if there was an instrument out there that could add more dyes and mix across them. Um, I, I personally think theoretically it could be possible. Um, the reason we don't want to get into spectral and mixing is uh, because we just want to capture all the data and we don't want to limit, um, we don't want to do any kind of uh, data manipul manipulation by removing what biology might be missed if we do add in that unmixing approach. 
Um, so uh, for all of you, we really do keep it to those spectrally distinct dyes. Yeah, and if I could just um, quickly talk about that registration, um, because that was actually one of my concerns. And so the work that Ulti had do has done so far for us uses their in-house registration tools. And as you can see, those TMAs, um, and anybody who's worked with TMAs would know that the when they get sectioned, the, the section itself can distort a bit more significantly than, say, I would a whole tissue section. So I was very curious to see how well it would accommodate the alignment in a TMA, just knowing the, the pre-handling uh, issues that can arise from it. Um, and so far, everything that we've looked at and the work that they've done, the alignment seems spot on. So I was actually quite impressed with um, how well it did. Thank you. Our next question is, in your reverse TME core work, did you look at virtual cores selected specifically from the advancing tumor margin versus a tumor center versus random? Yeah, that's actually a great question. And um, so I'll fill that one. Uh, that's exactly what we plan to do. So the initial pass uh, was to look at it randomly and just see what would look like against the whole tissue analysis. But of course, that doesn't really depict how we would actually generate a TMA because generally when we create them, we're looking at focused selected regions designated by a pathologist. So we plan to do exactly that. We're gonna look at a, a pathologist picking out the regions, fixed regions of interest and getting an assess of the coverage. So how many spots they put on there versus the whole tissue area and then make that assessment uh, based on the pathologist itself. Thank you. Our next question is, what kind of control slides are required? So uh, I think this, uh, I'm not 100% sure the specificity, the specificity of this question, but um, one assumption I'll make is that you're, you mean um, the control slides that would be used in optimizing the panel. So it, if that is the question, it's dependent on what the panel is. But for the most part, especially when you're looking at immune cell markers, uh, what we would do at AltaView is uh, by default, we would be using a uh, control like tonsil or lymph node, uh, any normal control, uh, any normal tissue. Um, in addition to that, uh, we also employ uh, cell pellets that are blocked, um, like PBMCs, so that we add an additional level of precision to the assay, um, just to ensure that uh, we're, we're not including any variables that may arise from variability in uh, tissue. Thank you. Our next question is, can this assay be used with RNA scope ISH? Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, we actually have a couple of uh, researchers that are looking into that right now. Um, I know that, uh, you know, right now the, the current approach is to do RNA scope and then uh, and a TSA based assay afterwards. Um, uh, what some researchers are looking into now is if we can do in situ plex first and then after that do RNA scope ish because we only are doing one antigen retrieval versus multiple. Um, so we don't have data on that yet technically, but we do have uh, researchers and collaborators that are currently looking into that. Thank you. Our next question is, how can you run the h &E without interference between iosin and fluorescent dyes? Yep, that's a good question too. So the reason you don't see that interference is because we're doing the immunofluorescence stain first and then capturing that image. And then after that, we're doing an H&E and, &E and uh, running a bright field scan. If we were to do the H&E first and then the inside duplex assay, then yes, the eosin would be picked up uh, in that fluorescent scan, but it's because we're doing the inside duplex assay first. Well, thank you very much for those answers. We've now reached the end of the Q&A portion of this webinar. If we weren't able to attend to your questions or if you have any follow-up questions, to please direct them to the email address on your screen right now. That's karan.sharma at altaview.com. Also, if, you can, if we couldn't attend to them, the team at Altaview may follow up with you after the webinar. Um, now, thank you everyone for participating in today's event. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with a recorded archive of this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen and your participation is appreciated as it will help us improve our webinars. Now, please join me in thanking our speakers and feel free to share the recorded version of this webinar using the link in the chat box when it becomes available to you. Have a great day, everyone.